I appreciate it. All right, I see some, fam some familiar faces, some new faces out here, so I appreciate it. Um, you probably know by now for the last nine years, 10 years of my life, I've been involved in the restoring of the last streetcar that we know that ran through Hampton and Newport News. Um, I was laid off for COVID, like some of, you, of us were, and during that time, I said, let's, let's write a book. So I did write a book. I did put everything that I knew at the time into a book. Um, it is for sale out in the lobby. If you don't have a copy, I'll be glad to sign away and things like that. So then I started thinking, OK, well, when I started writing, my wife said, you got to end sometime. You can't make a phone book. No one's going to want to read a phone book. So I left out a few things out of, the, out of the book. And one of the things I left out was about 1900. So that's where we're going to talk about today. So it could be a new chapter in a revised edition, or I might end up writing more chapters. Who knows? So going backwards to go forward, a little bit about the project that we're doing. If I know how to click, uh-oh. Ah. So there's the 390. If you haven't seen this picture, it's one of my favorites. This is in the early 40s in front of the Newport News Post Office. So that's what happened right there in that little house. That's how it all started. Um, this is the Anderson's house, John and Mary Anderson. Um, they bought the 390 when it was, went on sale in January of 46. And they lived in the car for about another 30 years until um, the winter of 76. That's Miss Anderson at the uh, back or front door. They only had one door in. Um, that was the kitchen area. For We know that by the, um, the smokestack, that they had a pot belly stove there. In 77, it was donated to the Hampton, I'm sorry, the Baltimore Streetcar Museum. And here it is being lifted off of a flatbed into the museum. And at the museum in Baltimore, it sat and sat until 2013, when the um, Baltimore folks contacted the Hampton folks and said, we have your streetcar, would you like it back? <laughs> and that's how I got involved in it. Um, it was delivered down here. We raised enough money to bring it down in uh, August of 17. Here it is going into Fort Monroe. We uh, worked with uh, Glenn Holder, who gave us part of the, the building. We could stay in there as long as we want for the restoration process. Our hope is to build a, um, a pavilion, an educational pavilion, which would be right outside in the grassy area where everybody passed to walk in today. And this is our, our vision of what we're going to be building. And there's a backdoor look um, to it. So let's get into the, the nitty gritty here, as they say. Okay. So the first streetcar in Hampton was by James Darling. Um, he's the, um, the entrepreneur of everything in Hampton. Right after the Civil War, he came down from the north to, with lumber, sold lumber, started Fish Oil Company started this, that, and the other thing. And he also started the first streetcar um, line. This first streetcar line was a horse-driven car. It was about a four and a half mile track. It went from downtown Hampton out to Phoebus and out to the VA. His hope was to pick up passengers on the, uh, coming from the docks in, on the Baltimore Wharf and take, taking them into Hampton or taking them over to the VA. And he thought that he could make money doing that. A few years later, it became electrified, and the Darlings be became the first electric company in Hampton. Um, when that happened, the only people allowed to have electric lights in Hampton were storekeepers. It wasn't then until about three, four, five years later that poles started to sprop up and electrical lines were starting to be strung to um, homes and things like that. So in terms of electricity, um, the proper date for that is, I think it was 93, 94, 18. And so James is on the one side. The color photographs is, is Colonel Buxton. At the same time this was happening, Colonel Buxton was in Newport News. He got a, a few of his cronies together. He was an engineer by trade working for the CNO. He did a lot with the shipyard in the early stages 
of the shipyard in terms of designing all the rail tracks going through the yard and um, in the shipyard. And he got together and he started his first streetcar in Newport News. Unfortunately for him, he died very short time afterwards, so he did not see it become too efficient. He um, also did a um, horse-drawn carriage, and then finally it was electrified. Oh, I'm doing it again. Sorry, guys. Okay, we'll just go like this. Okay, that's one of the early cars. Um, this is an Armstead where the first car barn was. If you look at it today, it was on the corner of, I'll just say where the Walgreens is right now. Um, that was the first power station um, for the Darlings and the first car bar. All right, the rivalry begins. This is where the new chapter of the book was, will, will be added in time. In 1900, this gentleman right here, and his name is J.W. Helms. He was a lawyer in Newport News. Him, along with folks from York County, from Williamsburg, from Norfolk, Portsmouth, also some folks from New York State and Philadelphia came together and said, we need to start up another streetcar, because one wasn't enough. Now, maybe they said, hey, look how successful that line was, OK? Or maybe they said, let's just do it, do it on our own and see if we can be successful and maybe take, take some passengers away. Um, so in 1900, they, they got their, their charter from the, from the Virginia State um, Commission to uh, call it the Hampton Roads Railway and Electric Company. So they also made power, and they would sell that power to the residents of uh, Newport News. By mid-February, whoops, and I did it by itself, so I don't know why it did that. So what they, what they tried to do is say, well, the main line of the, what I call the Old Point line stretched from along Electric Avenue of Victoria. That was the most direct route from downtown to Newport News. So they had to come up with their own way of, of, of bringing cars from Newport News all the way out to Hampton and onward. You know, they dreamed to go on to Fort Monroe at the docks. They dreamed about going to the VA. They dreamed about going to Buck Row and so forth. So the only other way they could think of was along what we now call the Boulevard or Chesapeake Avenue, which was easy to pick up in Newport News, run it through land that really didn't have any people along there. There was only a few houses in that early time. Um, the Robinsons was one of them. The Ewings were another one. Mc Mc McMinimans were another one. And that's about all we had. It wasn't like today that, you know, wall-to-wall -wall houses along the waterfront. So they started, to, they picked the route, and they started to lay track um, in, two, in around mid-1901 is when they started to finally start laying track. They started in Newport News by the shipyard, working their way through the shipyard, down towards the boulevard, and then going across um, Chesapeake Avenue and then up LaSalle Avenue, going past LaSalle, going up a couple of blocks. I think it might have been Pembroke, I'm not sure. Making a right, going down into Hampton. So that was their hope. But problems began from day one, okay? The biggest problem they had was this magic word that the courts say injunctions. Okay, stop work order. Um, a lot of people didn't like them going on their land. So they went through Newport News City pretty easily because they got franchise rights to do that, that they paid their like five cents per mile um, franchise rights to be in Newport News. But when they came down to the boulevard, that's when things start getting hairy. Most of the residents of the boulevard were down in the Newport News side, down by where the hospital is. That's where most of the population was on the boulevard. But then you had landowners going today on the other side of Pear um, and so forth. So one of the landowners was um, Mr. Contrell. Okay, he owned land along the boulevard. And while they were laying tracks, he came out with a shotgun and said, get, get off my property. Now, these there's about laying track, they had about 200 people doing it. It's all manual labor. They had to fix the road bed first, then they had to lay the track, and then they had to do all sorts of things. 
So he came out with a shotgun and he pretty much said, get off my land. They looked at him like, who are you? So he raised up his shotgun and he shot towards the mule who was, had a plow attached to it with a worker behind holding the plow, you know, making the road bed. And so he shot at the mule, the mule, again, he missed it. And then he said, the next shot is gonna be at the driver of, of, that, of that thing. So they stopped work. Uh, Mr. Contell got an injunction to stop. A deal had to be made financially. And so they were able to lay track through his land. A few months later, it happened again. And the, the guys by the name of Lakes got in disagreement with, with, the, uh, with the new line. Um, the new line offered, offered them $4,300 for a piece of property that was around 150, 1,500 feet long and about 30 feet wide. He wanted 25,000. Okay. Now, back then, if you think about how much things cost nowadays versus back there, when they first started thinking about putting up this, this line, that they were thinking it's going to cost between, back then, about 300000 to 500000 $500,000. When the line first opened up in 2002, and it wasn't completed in 2002, it was upwards to 33, today's dollars, $33 million to do that. Now, when you start thinking that it's a five cent car fare, that's, I don't even know if we had enough residents during those times to have a rivalry and compete. And they soon found that out. There was also issues with, with injunctions crossing LaSalle Avenue because they had to cross over the main line. So the old point line, they stopped them every time, every chance they got. Injunction, injunction, injunction. They even put a guard up to stop the work. So they hired a guy with a gun and, and stayed on the corner, but he got off at midnight. <laughs> so we know what happens, right? <laughs> Hampton Roads come through and they put their line and made the injunction to cross over old point line and it was done. And that was the only way, the only way them to get downtown. So a lot of those things happened over the course of, of, of 1902. But let's go back a little bit. Another fun thing you have, if you have a streetcar, you have to have power, electrical power. You have to have a car barn to keep all the cars in and report them. So the company decided to purchase property. And if you look at, there's two smokestacks in the picture. The lower smokestack is the O Point powerhouse, okay, that ran the electricity in Hampton and so forth. The smaller smokestack over to my right, which I don't know which is your left or which your right, depending on what you're looking at, that's where they decided to put theirs. And the reason why, they said, well, back then all the power stations ran on coal. So they had to bring coal in somehow. So the best way to do it is, is purchase barges and run them from Newport News Point where the coal was coming in, go around the point, come up, and go down Sunset Creek. And this is what you're looking at, the Sunset Creek. Problem is, guess who drudged, who drudged out Sunset Creek? Old Point, <laughs> Newport News Railway. Another junction came up. You can't cross. You can't use it. So they had to work that out to be able to do it. So all of this stuff was going on and going on and going on. And finally, in 1902, the first car ran down the boulevard. And it ran it all the way through. They were not in Phoebus yet. Um, there was more injunctions going on because the Hampton Roads line, they wanted to run a parallel line with O Point. And O Point said, well, we own that right away. You can't go on there. And to the court say what? for more months and more judge orders and whatever, and they were finally able to run their lines parallel down Mellon Street and Mallory. So when you see postcards that have two lines going up and down, one was Hampton Roads line, one was the O Point Newport News line. So a little bit of stuff, a little bit of cool stuff involved in it. One of their goals of, of um, Hampton Roads was to bring their line onto Fort Monroe. 
So they want to comp they want to compete with O Point. So where's the most people coming from? They're coming off the the steamers. They're coming from Baltimore, Philadelphia, Washington. Norfolk was sending steamers over to O Point, and of course all the Navy guys, Army guys that were coming ashore for leave. So let me. I got to go back one because I went ahead. So this map is really cool. So I'm going to jump off of this this table here just to point out something really cool. I'm going to use this one over here, and I didn't bring a pointer because I forgot my forgot to ask my friend for a lighted pointer today. But this is the Boulevard line, right here. Okay, it went this way, this way, this way, this way, this way to Newport News. So the Boulevard line came here. Here's LaSalle Avenue. Here is the power station for Hampton Roads Railway. They put a line at the end of LaSalle over what we call Church Creek, which is not a creek anymore right now. It's more like a marsh. And they ran a line through today's Merrimack Shores over to Sunset Creek, where their power station was. And that's how they got to their car barn every night. And that's where they worked on their, on their cars. So that's pretty cool, because when you go out there and you stand at the end of the cell, and you look out, and you, and you say, what the heck? How did that get there? OK, so what they did was they built two bridges. This is a 1930s image of the wooden crossing over um, Salters Creek in Newport News. And what it did, this was a drawbridge. When they first installed the bridge, the, the fishermen who were farther up in the creek said, I can't get out to the bay. And so they had to spend more money, which they didn't want to do, to put a drawbridge up. And it was a manual, broad, manual draw bridge. It wasn't nothing mechanical. They had to turn the wheel to get it up. They let the boat through, and then somebody had to turn the wheel to get the trolley through. And it's an interesting picture. If you see, there's really no road here like there is today. You just see all the grass. You see like a little path. And, and my understanding is that's how the boulevard was. It was just a path until the streetcar came. And then it became a bigger path. And then finally a road that we know today, which was pretty cool. All right. Here's another look. This is, oh, sorry. This is Phoebus downtown. You see the two lines, the two tracks there. So again, in, in 02, the, these guys said, we'll go, we'll go back to what happened on Fort Monroe, because it all happened in the same year. So in 02, these guys, the new guys on the block, the Hampton Roads Railway, said, we need to have a resort. Those other guys, they got buck row. So we need one, too. So they came out with big fanfare, and it was in newspapers all over the East Coast, that they were going to buy the Hygieia. Now, if you remember the history in 02, the Army came in and said, the, the um, Hygieia, you need to go away. We don't take down the building because we want to build things, other, for, for, other buildings for other needs for the Army. As you know, history tells us that never happened. It became a park for all that time. But the Hampton Roads Railway the guy said, hey, we can take it apart and we can rebuild it. And guess where they wanted to rebuild it? Come on, think, 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 think Hampton, guys. To where? Not by the chain, no. Grandview. They wanted to make the whole hotel to Grandview to be able to take, pick up customers and take customers from Newport News to Grandview. Of course, we know that never happened. Okay, And one of the reasons why it didn't happen is that in 1902, Hampton Roads Railway also got a message from the Army saying, we're not letting you on the base. They spent, I'm sorry, it was in 04. I'm sorry, four years later, they applied in, in 1900. In 04, they got word that they weren't allowing them coming on the base because they believed that the base was too small to have two different companies to, to service by streetcar people. So they said, O Point wins, you lose, you lose out. But they said, if you can work a deal with O Point to use their track, you can bring your cars on, on to O Point. 
Did that happen? Nah. Nah. So all these combinations of things happen. And, and I really kind of feel bad for these guys. You know, they were pumping money into this new line. Um, they went out, to, they went to, to try and get customers. Is, is in, when they got to Phoebus, they were offering a five cent fare from Phoebus all the way to downtown Newport News. Okay. What O Point was doing by then, okay, was having zones. So it was five cents a zone. So you can go from Phoebus to downtown for five cents. Then you go from downtown to Hampton Roads Avenue for another five cents. Then for another five cents, you get to go to downtown Newport News. Okay, so it took 15 cents for those guys, five cents for the other guys. They didn't seem to work either, well, I can say. By 1905, the bondholders of the Hampton Rose Railway Company put the line up for sale. It stayed in receivership for quite a long time. Um, they changed their name to the Hampton Rose Traction Company. They got rid of the electric company add-on, okay? And they were just kind of running the boulevard route for them. A couple of things happened that, that was good for them. The 07 exhibition. Okay, we know about the Jamestown exhibition 07. We know that we had the front seat here in Hampton along Chesapeake Avenue. Okay, and so they were saying, hey, come ride our excursions. We can take you close to all the battleships in, on the bay. We can see all the buildings across the way on a clear sky. And they're running up and down the boulevard. Okay, showing off the uh, um, exhibition. They also got in cahoots with a company in, in Newport News that built a pier. A pier that they hoped would bring in steamers to the area, and then they could use a streetcar to go into whatever. Um, well, unfortunately, the pier didn't get built until after the start of 07, and all the steamers already made other arrangements for docking privileges. So they had this nice, beautiful pier, and they just had pleasure craft tied up to it. Yes. And, and no large steamers with thousands of people that they were hoping for. Um, but, but the traction company got into, you know, worked with them and, and got their schedule aligned to be able to pick up people on that end of it, um, which is pretty cool. The two big, biggest events in, in 07 with Jamestown was on May 13th when the whole fleet lit up in, in, the, uh, in, in the harbor. And then on, a seven, on, 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 the, on September 14th, they lit up all the buildings and all the buildings were electrified. And apparently it was quite a show. There was postcards made for it um, and things. I am behind in my slides. Okay, Hygieia, there you go. There you go. They changed the name. And then we get into the exhibition. The harbor I just talked about. There's the advertisement they did in the Daily Press. Okay, so everybody knows you got to come down. And then I, I did a postcard there of, of two of the buildings lit up in the sky on, on September. Um, the Jamestown guys also, whenever a new building opened, because if you know with Jamestown, not everything opened up at one time, but every time that a, a building opened, that building would be under lights and shining and welcome everybody to a new building at night. Um, but on the, um, on the 14th of September, every, everybody lit up, which I guess was quite a sea, a sight. Okay, there's the fleet lit up. This is another, another postcard. Just kind of a cool, cool thing, okay? Now what happened in 08, still under receivership. So O Point stepped up and said, we'll take you over, but we will run you as a subsidiary, not as part of the O Point Newport News Railway, okay? So that happened in 08. What, the good thing out of this was that the traction company was able to go on Fort Monroe, but they did not go to the dock. They didn't went as far as, come on. I wish I practiced more. There we go. Anybody know what that hotel is? The Sherwood Inn. The Sherwood Inn. So 
the, uh, the Hampton Roads Traction Company only, only went as far as the Sherwood Inn, and then they backed out all the way down. I don't know what the reason why Oak Point would not let them on there. Um, I, have, I couldn't find that out just for any reason at all. Okay, so now Oak Point is running it. Okay, it's underneath their operation. Um, they swallowed up all the personnel. In a way, they were still using the, um, the shops and the um, powerhouse um, on, this, are on the west side of um, the creek. And in 1914, they worked to have the first ferry that was in Hampton. And this is at, on, the Manate on the Manio Drive. This is the Warwick, their first ferry. It was a double ended, which was really new for the area, where you could drive in one end and drive off the other. The ferry didn't have to turn around. Um, the, the owners of the ferry company and the streetcar company, they're all intermixed. The Armstrongs were involved in there, the Darlings were involved in there, even though by this time the Darlings were not part of the streetcar, um, 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 streetcar company or the electric company, but they got involved in it. Um, and so they set it up, and we know the story, for two years it ran. By 14, um, they moved it down to the, sm the small boat harbor in uh, Newport News. By January 1914, they swallowed up the sub subsidiary of, the, of, of, the, of uh, Hampton Roads Traction Company. Um, they also swallowed up the electric company. They also swallowed up a gas company. They also swallowed up some really small um, streetcar companies. In Newport News, because it was a little more spread out than Hampton was, there was a lot of streetcar companies that ran around just a couple blocks around where the homes were. Um, the O Point ran the main route where all the people were. They had no interest in going into the neighborhoods and spending all their time picking up people and whatever. And so these, all, these, all these other little guys, they picked up people and then they brought them downtown because they didn't have rights to go anywhere else and, and moved on from there. Also what happened in 1914 when they swallowed up, they also decided not to, to I'm sorry, also decided to abandon the powerhouse and the shop I'm sorry, on, on um, I got my creeks mixed up, on Sunset Creek. So that building laid empty for a year or two, and the streetcar company let the Battery D of our National Guard unit here in Hampton take over the building. At that time, the National Guard was, was basically a, um, a cavalry unit, um, what they did was have all these horses and they dragged these wagons around. They would set them up in war and so forth. Um, this is a shot of Battery D. They're in Texas in this photograph um, on training. Um, so they moved in and what they did was they converted the shops to, to a, a, a ring for practicing with their horses. The horses were stabled in the, in the powerhouse area along with um, offices and mess hall and beds for people and things like that. So um, it was pretty cool that the building had a life of its own. But the building continued to live. So you think of right now the, the Hampton Road Traction Company, Hampton Roads Railway Company, that's all gone. You know, it's out of everybody's mind. But the two buildings stayed. So in 14, um, and I think it was 15 they moved in. Um, I think in 16, they were called up for, to go to Spain, if my memory correct, and they left for a while. They, got in, they didn't get into the Spanish War or, or out there, but they were ready to serve if they were needed. They were in training, then they were called back home. When they came back home, they disbanded for a while, for a long time. So what happens to the building? I don't know what happens to the buildings. There, oops, oh, I can't go back. All right, I don't know how to go back. How are we doing on time there? 7.30. Okay. Hey, I'm talking fast because I was told I don't have a lot of time. I can't go back. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Okay, so this is an overhead shot. And what happened was in 1917, the Newsom Boat Works came down from Richmond, 
and they did they got the, the lease to take over the two buildings and they were charged to build um, what, what I would call submarine chasers um, they added on a couple more buildings into the property um, and then you can see over to the to the middle of it you see a hull of some sort being built um, in the middle there um, what are you looking at so I know oh you're seeing preview okay See, I, I'm, I'm, I messed up now. I totally screwed it up. So here's one of the boats they built in, at Newcomb. Okay, I think there was five altogether, um, and they actually worked. The problem was, because they were all wooden, they were acceptable to fire and stuff. And we know you know, steel hulls were coming on, more and more people were making steel hulls, and they made the wooden ones obsolete. So when they were done with us, another company came in, and they were the Hampton Shipyard and Marine Railway took over the buildings. And what they did is they came in and they made barges. And um, they also made um, steamers and so forth. This picture here is from the, the, the library here at the museum. And you see that construction of that large boat there. Um, which is pretty big, I think, not knowing boats. You can see the structure, the wood structure going up there. What I think that is, is this. Okay, I have documentation from the uh, museum, um, the Mayor's Museum, okay, that the lorry was built in Hampton and then was shipped to the Baltimore Packing Company who owned the Baltimore Lines. Um, so I think the two pictures are together. I'm not sure yet. Um, they, they did this steamer here. They did a couple other steamers. They did about six or seven um, barges that they made there. Before they closed up shop, went bankruptcy and decided to leave. So the building again sat, sat there empty. I don't know what I did, I'm sorry, sir. I know. Still on preview. There we go. Yeah, I know. I'm, I'm, mess, I'm messing up. So what else is new? So the building set, the two buildings sat empty. They went through the boat making um, possibility. And so next came to the building. It's just an amazing story that this building has lasted all this time. And it's the last, basically, if you look at today's streetcar thing, it's the last thing that's still up. Okay. So they, they built this uh, lovely little ship here. Oh, yeah, like that works. But then in the uh, 1920s, the National Guard regrouped. And so they went back to their old stomping grounds. They fixed it up. They did some fun things. And what they did because it was still a horse-driven unit, because trucks and, and vehicles haven't been worked into the army yet and all, all the way down. So to keep the horses active is that they, they had polo matches, okay? And Fort Monroe had a polo horses. The National Guard in Newport News had polo horses. The National Guard in Norfolk had the um, Langley guys had pole horses, um, and the guys out in uh, Newport News at Port Eustace. So they all got together, and they had rosters and standings and championships and stuff like that. This photograph has been misinterpreted by a lot of people as a horse racing track. But when I got into writing this chapter, I believe this is the Battery D's Polo Match Grounds, which is in now, right now swallowed up by Merrimack Shores. And the reason I think that is when I zoomed in on this picture and I started doing research, they said that one of the guys bought 10 acres of land close to the, the, their armory, okay? 
And on the land, they had room for a football field or baseball fields or you know, large field activities and also a polo pitch. So I do believe this is more square than round for horse racing. Um, polo grounds are, you know, for polo, they're more square. What I don't see in this picture when I blow it up is a goal. Because there's usually a little goal on either end that you gotta throw that little ball through. So I don't see that, but if you look in the upper left-hand corner, you see a smokestack. You can barely see it. So you see how close it is to the armory. So to me, it makes sense that this was the polo grounds and not a, a racetrack for horses or stuff. Whoops, I did it again. All right. So they stayed there until 1930s when there was a massive fire. So this is a great aerial view of the fire. Um, what you're seeing is a, uh, is a powerhouse that was out the roof on it. And the shop and barn for streetcars is still all intact. This fire happened at night. Um, there was one person, um, I, don't, I don't know, on guard or present, like a, 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 a keeper. He was able to get all the horses out of the barn. There was like 50 some odd horses at the time. They were able to get the horses out and move them out um, and save a little bit of equipment. But the whole thing was destroyed. Um, they worked with the city of Hampton and they moved into downtown um, in the 30s. I think it was one of the YMCA buildings or some kind of a building there where they could meet and have some drills. The horses were kept someplace else in Hampton. Um, and that stayed like that until like, the story goes on and on, and I don't know how much time I have. The story goes and goes on until 1946, when a company who made female lingerie and underwear took over the building, rehabbed it, and that company employed around 110 people. And it's a lot, um, the name of the company is called Loss, L-A-R-O-S. They lasted two years. They promised Hampton the world. We're going to be here forever. We're going to employ up to 300 people. That was their thing coming in and taking over that property. They did put a lot of money into it um, and so forth, which was really nice of them. But they abandoned it, and it stayed vacant for a while until what we have today is I'm pushing the right button, there it is. If you go down Newcomb Avenue today, you will see the Hastings Building. Um, they have a new um, addition on the front. They have a big building on the left side. But if you peek around the corner, you'll still see the main structure of the shop and the barn of the um, Hampton, Roads Tran Hampton Roads Transit Traction Company, excuse me. So they took it over in 1952, um, and they've um, been in there ever since. So if you're in Hampton, you wanna take a ride down memory lane, you go down Newcomb, which is off of Ivory, Ivy, um, which is off to the, when you go down to eat dinner at the um, Surf Rider. Just take, I think, the first, the first left is Newcomb, and go down to the dead end. Um, yes, mm -hmm. yep, yes, sir, which is pretty cool, pretty cool. So let's go back to the bus streetcars. 33 hurricane came. In the late 20s, buses were slowly taking over anyways of the line. Okay, all, all the major lines except the one line, which was the main line going from Hampton to Newport News, which went down Elizabeth Avenue, that one was still intact. But all these smaller, smaller stops that they made and, and smaller lines, like out to East Hampton or to the east end of Newport News, they converted those to buses. Um, a lot of reasons, um, we could spend hours talking about the reason why buses came on hand, but they did. In 33, the biggest damage um, in, in, the 30s, in, in the 33 hurricane, besides the bridges to Fort Monroe, the bridges over to Langley um, that really made them twisty and meadow was the boulevard line. 
it just destroyed the boulevard line. The boulevard line was made close to um, the shoreline, and the hurricane just killed it. Um, it, it went, the water went underneath it, and the dirt went with it up to shore. So these are some of the pictures here. This just show you how mangled it is. Um, a couple days later, after the hurricane, the streetcar company slash bus company um, um, ran buses down the boulevard so they wouldn't interrupt anybody that needed to go that way. Um, there's another sign, so you can see just just follow through. This, the streetcar company really didn't have any reason to rebuild. Um, they knew buses were coming on strong. That's a wave of the future. Um, the cost at the time in, in, in 33 money was around $500,000 just to fix the line. Because they, there was argument with the county slash city about who was going to build the bulkhead. Once they get that argument out of the way, and that argument never went away. Um, they decided to say, hey, you know, we don't need to do this. Um, they went ahead and put buses um, on the route. A little more pictures of the destruction along the boulevard. Okay. Um, it's just massive, um, massive mess. Um, this is a great picture here I wanted to always um, put out there. Um, this is a great shot of the, um, the, 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 the barn on uh, Electric Avenue. What this shows the new and the old. You had the streetcar in and you had the bus on the outside. And this was the type of bus in the um, late 30s, early 40s that went everywhere um, and so forth. Um, the last streetcar, as uh, you, you know me preaching about this, ended, um, ran in uh, January 14th at midnight. Um, the last, that's when the last car was taken off. There was no fanfare. Um, other cities, when they stopped doing the streetcar to run the buses, they had parades, they had flyers, they had all sorts of excitement. We didn't have any of that yet. One day they were there, next day we're not. Um, the only difference is when they took the uh, streetcars off, is what they started running buses on, on Kitakan Road versus Electric Avenue. So that's where the stops were made, and they basically let um, the, the Electric Avenue go to waste. Um, overgrown, I saw a few pictures that had weeds over my head. And I'm only 5'8". It was just a really one big stretch of, mu of mush and mess. Um, until the, the cities and the state decided, let's put in the new concrete highway to connect the cities. So, all right. So that's a little bit of a, a new chapter I've been writing. So hopefully you enjoyed that um, and stuff. I will, I will take questions at the end. But I want to talk about artifacts, OK? Because one of the goals of our project, and the reason why we named it project, is because there's more facet to us. We're just not restoring a car putting on display and just walking away. Okay, the idea was to embrace the history of the streetcar and what it meant to the folks in the, night, in the 20th century, sorry, 20th century. Um, and so we're always on the lookout for artifacts, okay? Here's one artifact here that we got from a gentleman in the, in the audience. This is a hat badge, okay? Um, it's the only one in the museum's possession that I know of and we're on the outlook for more. One of the reasons we're on the outlook for more is because we know from talking to other gentlemen and in, in, in other places that said in 1954, a bunch of people were hired to clean out the, um, the administration building that sat, that had the turret that sat in front of um, the barns. And they were told to dump everything and anything. And so we have no records we have no nothing um, in terms of history. Most of our history is coming from old newspapers here in Hampton, around the state. Um, also, um, looking at old journals. Um, there's a lot of trade journals back in the day that did reports on Hampton Newport News because um, we were one of we were pretty progressive, and so people looked for us at what we were doing um, and for that. So this was a hat badge. And recently, we received these. Th these are, are 
conductor badges and uh, motorman badges. I'm wearing one today on my, on my outfit. Um, we were um, given 26 of these in random numbers. Okay, which is, you know, when, when he came and visited, I just exploded with, I couldn't wipe the smile off my face, if you guys know who I am. But then he had more surprises for me. Okay, the, um, James and William Barlett are their names. They, they came and visited me one Saturday morning when we were work, volunteers were working in the streetcar. And he said, my dad was working on the buses and he grabbed all this stuff. And I said, cool. So he waved his little Ziploc bag with these. And then he said, I got more stuff in the truck. Okay. So one of the things he had in his truck was this. That's, one, that's a header from a 1914 smoking car. Now you're going to say, what the hell is the smoking car? Excuse my language. That's a smoking car. There was only four of these purchased in 1914 from the Brill Company. And what the smoking car did was when you came in, you went through one door and you had about four or five seats. And then you opened another door and you had four or five seats. That was a smoking area. And you had two doors inside the center of the car that kept people smoking. So you have smoking free. Now, did it work? I doubt it. You know, you think the smoke will get out. This is an all wood car. So, so besides this, he brought a full door, a half a door that was cut off for some reason. And we have a lot of pieces we have identified what they were used for. But they're all about this size. They all have hinges on it and stuff. But there was a couple pieces, matter of fact, four pieces that were numbered 51, 52, 53, 54. So we do have that num numeric number, and that's how we could trace it to what car it went to and find out what it was. So another cool thing about this car is you see where the conductor would stand way at the end? That's not closed in. He worked out there in rain, sleet, snow, cold, whatever. And if you notice, there's no seat there. They had a stand. They weren't allowed to have a seat until later on when the, um, the streetcar company said, OK, we'll install seats for everybody, which was, I guess, an exciting thing to do. So always be on the lookout for artifacts for us. Let Lucy know or, or, me, or I know or, um, because it, it helps tell the story of what we want to try and tell. Update on the streetcar, right? We always want to have an update, right? Where are we now? Oops, sorry, we, we went and got it all done. <laughs> Every year in November, I, we, we do an open house because um, I want everything to be transparent. If you donate money, I want you to, sh to show you where your money is going. Um, this is not the newest photograph. It's just one I happen to have on the computer. We are, we are moving along on it. Um, I wish I could say it would be done by now, but I'm getting held up which is out of my control by Keith Bray. As you know from speaking, um, hearing me speak before, we've hired Keith Bray, who is a streetcar extraordinary person who can build streetcars in his sleep. Unfortunately, he is overworked for a one-man operation. And a lot of museums are pulling at his coach strings, come finish this project you started two years ago. COVID put everybody on a stop, museums, everybody was pretty much stopped for a year and a half to two years. Um, he told me he was supposed to be here in February. We, if he ever decides to get here and work straight, the streetcar should be done within eight months with the restoration. Problem is getting here. So in the meantime, our volunteers, which we have about six to eight volunteers that show up every Saturday morning, and please feel if you want to volunteer, we're continually working on windows and moldings, um, doing the sanding, um, making them ready for staining and painting. Um, you know, we have over 100 windows of frames we have to clean up. So we're still working on that process. But the big stuff that Keith is was supposed to be doing, like in the front of this picture, you have, sorry, you know, that whole thing needs to be rebuilt from scratch. When we took it apart, it was all rotten wood. 
Um, if you notice in the picture, you see a lot of new wood on the window stanchions. It's because every window stanchion was rotten and couldn't be saved um, to, have, to have the car sturdy. Um, you see that header board going around the top. Um, we saved, we were able to save that and he married that into um, the new, the new um, sideboards there. So we were trying to keep as much original as we can. Um, but if it's just not worth saving and repairing, we're just, trying, we're just moving ahead. People ask me all the time, what percent of the car is going to be original? What percent of the time is going to be new? Well, when we got the car and went across through the home for the Anderson, there was no seats in the car. There was no nothing in the car. So we had to go out and buy seats. We had to buy controller boxes. We had to buy gadgets and this and that to represent what the car looked like in 1917, because that's the era we bring the car back to. So if you take that in mind, original on that car, we're probably talking maybe 25% to 35%. Everything else has been bought from other museums and things or making deals with other people to get parts in. Those are, are not, I would say, original to the car, but they're the right era for the car. So if you go on the car, you won't, you won't know the difference. Um, we're trying to make it true, is what we can do. All right, we're on Facebook, as you know. Um, become a member of us, so keep in tabs, and I will post different things on there. And you know about my book cover, which is right there. And where do I get all the photos? So Hampton History Museum has a great photo, and I'm collecting photos. I buy photos on eBay. Um, that have that come up once in a while of streetcars in our area um, and other types of areas I buy, which I'm going to be donating. It all goes to the museum, which they'll put it on their website. The Daily Press is a great source. The problem with the Daily Press is that because of a fire in 1901, there's no newspapers from 01 to 05. So where do I go from there? I go look into the Norfolk papers, the Virginia Beach papers, the Richmond papers. Danville papers, because there was a, a connection with the Hampton Streetcar Line and Danville guys. So there's information that crosses over there. Um, for private, private collectors, Hank Munford, who's um, one of our board members, is a, is a good collector of photographs. Tim Receiver is, is a guy in Phoebus who um, does that Phoebus website and so forth. He got some really nice pictures. And the Mariners Museum is also a good source. I now have an inside guy. One of our volunteers is now volunteering um, at the Mirrors Museum. His job is to catalog a photograph. Oh, <laughs> you're mine. So the photographs of the, of the lorry that was previously, that came from him. And just recently found a uh, streetcar photo that I've never seen before of a streetcar near the Hygieia um, in the Chamberlain, which is a, a new photograph to see. So he's on the lookout, and he's sending us some, some photos. So. I am done. I want to thank you for your time. It's only 8 o'clock. I am, I am open for questions. Yes, sir. Thank you. Wonderful presentation. Um, so from what I see on maps, the streetcar line, and I don't know which one, did have a stop at the Hampton Institute. Yes. Right. We were, we were lucky here in our area. As, as you know from the history, you know, with, with the blacks and us, we didn't have the problems that other cities had um, in the Jim Crow era. Jim Crow era started in 1902 um, when um, the South, earlier than that, down South, they were enacting these laws. The laws made it to the Virginia Assembly in, in 1902, and they started enacting these laws here in the state. The streetcar company at the time s said, there's no problem here. We don't see it. We don't think there's an issue. We're not enforcing. And they didn't enforce until 06, when the two cities, Hampton and Newport News, stepped up and saying, we're enforcing it on you. And what they did was they deputized the motorman, they deputized the um, whatever I'm wearing, the conductor, to arrest people who weren't going to sit in the right spot. 
okay? And that lasted until the First World War, the buildup to World War I. What happened was more people showed up here. The streetcars are only so big. And they said, hey, nobody cared anyways. Um, there was an article in one of the newspapers I read in, oh, I think it was 1910, where a white gentleman was sitting in a black section on the streetcar. And we didn't have any lines in our streetcars that said blacks, whites. Um, the conductor or the motorman would say, you had, these are your assigned seats type of thing. Um, and there was an, a small little snippet in our newspaper that said, you know, um, Joe Blow, who is white, got arrested for sitting in the wrong seat. And the article went on, I did a little interview of the gentleman, and he said he didn't care where he sat. You know, but they had orders that if they didn't arrest him on the streetcar, that they would be arrested by the police. So it was kind of a weird thing. But when we hit, when we hit 17, 1917, all bets were off. Um, they, 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 they had it, but they didn't have it. World War II was even worse, because there was even more people in our population here in World War II than there was in World War I. And there was just no room to do it. And so they, they really didn't practice that. Mm -hmm. right? So the, the story goes that uh, uh, the men were trying to get back to base before curfew, and the conductor of the streetcar was insisting that the black sailors would go to the back, so the white sailors took the conductor motorman off the streetcar, and they drove it back themselves to base because they didn't want to yeah. get them with curfew, and then uh, after that, there was no issue. Right. Um, yeah, it was pretty much that. Now, now, you know, we had problems on our streetcar. You know, the streetcar is not a rosy place. You know, especially with drunken sellers and stuff. You know, we had pickpockets on the streetcar. Um, you know, we had people hitting them. You know, each other fighting over a seat or fighting over a spot. They got arrested, and the streetcar killed people, many people in Hampton and Newport News. Um, so, you know, I don't talk about the sad part. Um, I think we're going to do a little bit when we do the exhibit, um, but I really don't talk about the horrors. You know, there was a four-year-old child who got ran over by a streetcar at the end of um, Hampton Roads Avenue in 1914. Okay, um, you know th those things are out there, um, so it's not all great to have a streetcar. They were it's a powerful machine, and you know they got up to speeds to th between 30 and 40 miles an hour. And they go as low as six miles an hour just to get the gravity to, to move those things. And you're talking a few hundred, to, not a hundred tons, but a, you know, a good five tons, six tons, you know, moving. It's hard to stop those things on a dime and stuff. So, any other questions? Yes. Uh, how many times did the streetcars cross the CNO Railroad? Well, that's a whole story by itself. <laughs> because in the beginning, they couldn't cross the CNO lines. Because the CNO line basically divided Newport News in half, okay, about where they ended up doing. And so the main line, and, and same thing with the Hampton Roads um, Railway, they had the same problem. They would go up to the, all the tracks, they would stop the car, the people would get off one car, cross them by foot, and get on another one. Um, they have it at that time, and that was in 18, you know, the, the, you know, the 1890s, 18, you know, when they started that. Even in, in um, 1902, when, when the, the Hampton, or not Hampton, you know, the Hampton Roads were running at the time, they still had to stop and do it. They, it took a while for them to hire somebody to build a bridge over top of the tracks. The problem was, is that not a lot of cars were able to make it. And so the conductor got all the people off. The car would go over the bridge, <laughs> and the people would walk over the bridge to get back on the car, OK, until they could figure out logistics and things like that. Um, but that was, that was a hard nut to crack. It took years to crack that nut um, to, get over, to get over the tracks. And they had to get over the tracks to get to the shipyard. By the way, if you have a question, if you have a question, uh, 
give me a second to get to you before you start talking. <laughs> sure, nobody has a question I'm now. Scared you did. <laughs> so I appreciate everybody coming out today. Uh, my wife and friend Kurt um, is out front if you want to buy a book. I'll stick around if you want to do questions individually. Um, and please be on the lookout for stuff and keep me in mind or keep Lucy in mind for, for the streetcar stuff. So I appreciate everybody coming out tonight. Thank you very much. And I just want to thank you again for coming and please come back on the 16th for Poison Dwarf. They are always a good time. So anyway, and in the lobby, you'll see as you walk by the boat, the Hampton one, you'll see he also has t-shirts and I think a little donation box as well. <laughs> he is ready for you. Anyway, thank you so much.